Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with John Herlocker of Tignus, going to talk today about virtual metrology. This is part of an ongoing series about AI in semiconductor manufacturing. John, there's been a lot of talk about replacing physical metrology with virtual metrology. Everybody thinks, oh, AI can do this just better than everybody else. What's the reality here? Yeah, the reality is perhaps not as exciting as what everyone would hope. Uh, but uh, but I guess let's dive into that a little bit about what is virtual metrology and, you know, like, I guess how does it relate to machine learning, which we've been talking about. So, you know, we talked about how machine learning can take you know, these sort of function emulators. So it seems like, wow, why can't we emulate the metrology process, right? We have all the inputs that are coming into it. So, yeah, well, I guess let's step back. Uh, so, you know, what do we have? We have a process tool like an etcher or a litho machine, etc., CMP, right? Wafer goes into that. A process happens, right? And, and even though we'd like the process to be exactly the same every time, it's not really, right? Tools degrade, you know, incoming materials sometimes different. So we have what's called, we have variability. And so what comes out is, is going to have variability, which is why we need to measure it occasionally to say, to make sure that it's looking the way that we want to. So I guess the whole dream of virtual metrology is to say, well, we've got all these sensors on this tool here, right? Like all sorts of sensors. Surely with all this sensoring, we can detect, hey, this is different in this way, which means it's going to lead to this difference in measurement. That's the dream of virtual metrology. And so, you know, can we have this parallel process where we take all this sensor data that's coming off of this process tool, which can be some hundreds or thousands of, of sensors, and feed it into a machine learning model, which in turn then predicts what the metrology tool would do. Now, you know, if it's etched, maybe it's predicting the critical dimensions. If it's CMP, maybe it's, you know, predicting the thickness or the thickness variability. You know, it's, again, you know, we just need to be able to structure the sensor data like that matrix we talked about in that previous session, and we should be able to do a machine learning model. And then, you know, how would we use this? And then, so why would this be interesting, right? Well, in a perfect world, everybody hates buying metrology tools, right? They're not, they don't make more wafers. They just take up space and capital costs, et cetera. Wouldn't it be great if you could buy less? That's kind of the ultimate sort of number one dream. There's some other benefits too we can talk about in a later session about sort of improving process control by, you know, short circuiting KPC, but we'll leave that for later. But let's talk about this dream. The reality is, is, in, you know, I think I told you before that machine learning is great about predicting future states that look like past states. But the reality is we use metrology to detect things we didn't think were going to happen in many cases, right? And so you're never, I think that, you know, there, I don't know that virtual metrology is ever going to be sufficiently accurate enough to fully replace a metrology tool, right? Uh, in the sense that you can just, you know, if, you're, if you have to do metrology on all your wafers, you can stop doing metrology because you have virtual metrology. That's probably, but there are some regions where I think it can be applicable. And really what, what some of the customers are, were expecting was, what, 100% correlation between the virtual and the physical? I think that's really been the reason for, I mean, a lot of people have tried virtual metrology, and almost all of them have failed, right? Um, I mean, and again, I'll, I, I want to talk a little bit in a moment about the places where they've been successful, but the failures have almost be, I've always pretty much traced back to this mismatch between expectations and reality, is that... Can virtual metrology get pretty good? Yeah, sure, like maybe 80% or something, right? Can it get to 100 or 99%? No, it's just never going to get to that point. I mean, unless there's some magical future where the, you know, maybe the equipment maker co-designs it so that it perfectly manages the physics of the system, but I doubt it, right? I doubt, it just doesn't seem to me in the near term we're going to get perfect virtual metrology. Is it just too much variation, too many uh, individual types of... Um differences that uh, that you're wrestling with? Uh, too much data? What's the cause here? Yeah, I think the primary cause is that the cost of a failure is so high, right? A cost of a miss is so high. I mean, think about these advanced packages, right? They're just so expensive these days, or even these, these, these leading edge chips. You can't afford to have a fail on the metrology side. Um, and so I think that's a big part of it is this this in lack of sensitivity, not a, a lack of resilience to a failure in the metrology.
And I think that's one of the things. But, but I do want to talk a bit about where it can be applied, right? So in certain conditions, let's say that you already are sampling your metrology, meaning you don't actually put every wafer through metrology today, right? You choose some random sample of wafers that you put through metrology. I think if you're already in a condition where you've decided you can afford to not do complete metrology, then virtual metrology can be very effective because, you know, today you're already sampling, right? Why not? be smarter about that sampling. And so we hear this term called smart sampling. I think this is, is sort of a, a, one of the places that virtual metrology does make a lot of sense because you know, you're not doing any worse than you were doing before. You're just doing a better job of deciding which ones. And so you, you send the ones that get metrologied, <laughs> if that's a term, right? Um, that, are, that your virtual metrology suggests might be the most anomalous, right? And you don't waste your time on ones that it really looks like it was exactly the same as a good run. So so this is almost like you're doing an overlay on whatever you know and say, here's been the problems in the past. We spotted these before. Are they showing up on this wiper too? That's exactly right. I think you nailed it, right? It's like you're, then you're taking advantage of the parts that what you know is sort of what's happened before, but you're still doing some amount of maybe random sampling to catch the things that you didn't think were coming. Any other ways that virtual metrology can be used? Yeah, actually, uh, I'm super excited about one option, which we're, we're leveraging quite extensively, which is for, you know, taking advanced process control to the next level. So we'll talk about that in the next session. John Herwacker, thanks. Thank you.